Time is now 9.33 a.m. and a quorum of the board is present. State Board of Education meeting of February 8th, 2022 is called to order. The first item on the agenda is the approval of agenda and order of priority. Are there any items board members would like to add or delete from the agenda? Yes. Uh, Ms. Tilly. I would like to make an, a motion to amend the agenda to add Dr. Shelley Holt to do a presentation. Okay. For African American history or Black history. So we have a motion to amend the agenda to permit Dr. Holt uh, to present in honor of Black History Month. Do we have a second? Support. We have support from Dr. Pugh. Any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, if we could have oh, sorry. 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 Please. Um, I, I just wanted to say that um, I appreciate Tiffany reached out uh, ahead of time of this meeting to, to say, mention that she was going to make this request, and I appreciate that. Um, I would, uh, I'm inclined to support it because it is time specific, but I would just like to remind the board that we do have an agenda planning process, and I would uh, hope that members would use that process when requesting agenda items be added, if at all possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other discussion? Where is this going to be added? This would be added right before state and federal legislative updates. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Hearing none, Marilyn, a roll call vote, please. Just on the amendment? It is on the amendment, that's correct. Lipton? You're Lipton? You're muted, Alan. She can't hear us, I don't think. She can't hear us? Oh, here Alan, we go. Can you hear us? Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Maybe okay. she can hear us now. Ellen, can you hear us? Yes, I can now. Thank you. Okay. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, this is a vote to amend the agenda to add presentation on our Black History Month. Um, and I'm starting to take the roll call vote. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yeah. Pritchett? Yes. Pew? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Albrecht? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Are there any other motions to amend the agenda? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Ms. I would Snyder. like to move to add a uh, resolution to let parents speak to uh, item K. Okay. So we have a motion to Support. amend the agenda. Do we have a, a second? Support. A second from uh, Mr. McMillan. Uh, any discussion thereof? Hearing none. I'm sorry. Any discussion? I can there? wait. Okay. Um, hearing none. A roll call vote, please. Lipton. No. McMillan. Yes. Pritchett. No. Pew. No. Snyder. Yes. Strayhorn. No. Tilly. No. Albrecht. No. Motion fails. Any other motions to amend the agenda? Hearing none, if we could have a roll call vote on the uh, agenda as amended. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? No. Pritchett? Yes. Pew? Yes. Snyder? No. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Albrecht? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. At this time, Marilyn Snyder, our State Board Executive, will introduce the members of the State Board of Education. Yes, you have just been listening to the State Superintendent, Michael, Dr. Michael Rice, who serves as the Chair of the State Board of Education. And as we go around the table to his left is Dr. Cassandra Albrecht, President of the Board from Dearborn, and Dr. Pamela Pugh, Vice President of the Board from Saginaw, Ms. Tiffany Tilly, Secretary from West Bloomfield. She is in the room. She is sitting up above by the risers to Dr. Rice's left. Ms. Nikki Snyder, State Board of Education Legislative Committee me member from Dexter. Um, the Teacher of the Year is Ms. Leah Porter. She is a third grade teacher at Wilcox Elementary School in the Holt Public Schools. And then we go across the table and joining us virtually is the Governor's K-12 Policy Advisor, Ms. Stephanie O'Day. She's representing the governor as an ex-officio member, and she is joining us um, via technology. And then Judy, Dr. Judith Pritchett, 
She's the board's association delegate and State Board of Education Legislative Committee member from Washington Township. Mr. Drace, Jason Strayhorn, board's legislative committee member from Novi. Next to me, Mr. Tom McMillan, treasurer from Oakland Township. And joining us virtually, Ellen, Ms. Ellen Cogen Lipton, chair of the State Board of Education Legislative Committee. She's from Huntington Woods. She's joining us virtually in accordance with the American the ADA, American Disabilities Act. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Welcome to Stephanie O'Day, our K-12 policy advisor to the governor. Again, uh, it, it is uh, Ms. O'Day's first meeting representing Governor Whitmer as an ex-officio member of the State Board of Education. Deputy Superintendent Kyle Garant has a new employee to introduce. I'm very pleased that he will be introducing this new uh, leader in the department. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rice. It is uh, more my pleasure to introduce uh, Parsha Spoon as the new director of our administrative uh, law office. Good morning, um, board members. Um, my name is Precious Booms. I am the director of the Office of Administrative Law. I come to you from the Office of Attorney General, where I served as the head of section head of education. I was there um, for three years, and I'm happy to make this transition. I'm very excited about my new role. The Office of Administrative Law, as you may know, deals with um, making sure that individual educators and um, school boards get their due process rights. So our office reviews um, uh, appeals for um, property transfers, for state aid deduction decisions, for um, teacher tenure decisions. So we, we run the gambit here. And we also um, review and um, promulgate all the administrative rules for the Department of Education. So quite a bit on our plate. I am stepping into the role of someone who held the position for 35 years. Big shoes to fill, but I am up to the task and I'm very honored to be here. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boone, and welcome. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Dr. Scott Kennigschneck will introduce uh, virtually two experienced Michigan Department of Education employees serving in new roles. Dr. K. Yes, good morning, all, and thank you, Dr. Rice, for allowing us to <clears throat> share some great news some, with some new staff in our P20 uh, division. First, I'd like to introduce Ms. Amanda Stoll. Amanda is our new special assistant uh, within the division. Uh, when we interviewed Amanda, she said she grew up at MDE. Um, Amanda brings a wealth of experience um, at the department, um, has been with the department for over 20 years um, in a variety of roles. And so Amanda, would you like to say a few words about yourself, please? Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kinschnick, for the introduction. I'm so honored to be here and sharing with you and uh, state board members. If Scott took all my thunder. I was going to share how I grew up here at the Department of Education for nearly 20 years and have um, held roles as secretary, department technician, analyst, specialist, and now the special assistant to Dr. Kenishnik. So I'm very excited. I've worked with many of the offices across the department in policy analysis, grant administration, and review, and worked with educators and stakeholders across the state on many collaborative endeavors and initiatives specifically around technology and um, youth development and early childhood. So I'm very excited to be in this new role and being able to share with all of you and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Amanda. I would also like to introduce uh, Rebecca McIntyre. Uh, Rebecca McIntyre is our interim deputy director with the Office of Special Education. Education. Uh, Rebecca comes to us again from within the department, but she brings a wealth of experience from the field um, over 20 plus years um, in the field. And so, Rebecca, would you like to share a few words about yourself? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Kenichnek. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to meet the State Board of Education. I'm Rebecca McIntyre. I come to you today as the interim deputy director in the Office of Special Education. Um, I will be having and I'm enjoying thoroughly um, some very close work with Michigan School for the Deaf um, and doing a lot of work with um, our grant funded initiatives right now. So 
I am still serving also in our role in the um, special education for the program accountability unit. I'm the supervisor for that unit. Uh, we do, we work with uh, state complaints, due process complaints. Um, I work with questions in the promulgation of Michigan administrative rules for special education and everything else that's policy related, putting out our guidance documents and such. <coughs> I do come to the department with uh, background experience in working with the, or at the intermediate school district level and at the local school district level as well as a teacher. So thank you for the opportunity. Congratulations to Ms. Stoll and Ms. McIntyre on your new positions. Uh, Ms. Boone as well. And we roll forward. The public may register to provide comment during the public participation portion of the meeting at approximately 1 p.m. Those wishing to make public comment must register before 1 p.m. today. To provide public comment by telephone, please complete the registration form on the MDE webpage, www.michigan.gov backslash MDE. Provide public comment in person. Please complete a public comment form when you arrive here at the meeting location. These instructions are listed on the MDE webpage. Again, at www.michigan.gov backslash MDE. First item on the committee of the whole agenda is educational updates related to COVID. It is a relatively brief update, which I will share now. In Michigan, since our last State Board of Education meeting four weeks ago, the number of COVID-19 cases has risen from 1.68 million to 2.02 million, an increase of 337,984,000 cases, or approximately 20%, with the number of deaths increasing from 27,878 to 30,417 a rise of 2,539 deaths, or roughly 9%. Our vaccination rates continue to climb, slowly but steadily. As of last Friday, 69.6% .6 of Michigan residents ages 16 and above have received at least an initial vaccination, with 47.2% of students 12 to 15 years old and 25.6% of students 5 to 11 years old with at least an initial vaccination. As we increase the percentages of students vaccinated, we reduce disruptions to in-person instruction and adverse impact on student achievement as a result. In total, more than 14.8 million doses of vaccine have been administered to Michigan residents. Worldwide, 10.1 billion vaccine doses have been administered. It is with the vaccination of significant portions of our population that we are going to be able to minimize COVID cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Unvaccinated individuals are far more likely to be vulnerable than are vaccinated individuals for sickness, hospitalization, and death. According to the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center, worldwide there have been more than 397 million COVID cases and more than 5.75 million COVID-related deaths as of last night. Nationally, there have been 76.8 million cases and 905,000 deaths. With 19.3% of the world's cases and 15.7% of the world's deaths associated with COVID, the U.S. continues to lead the world in both categories. In our layering of mitigation strategies recommended by the Centers for Disease Control and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, vaccination is clearly of paramount importance. The growing number of Michiganders who are getting vaccinated are protecting not simply themselves, but others as well. You're helping to reduce sickness, hospitalizations, and death, and to increase the number of days and hours that our children and staff are in person in school. The layering of mitigation strategies requires masks, social distancing, proper hygiene, and at times testing, quarantining, and isolating as well. 
That is my brief report board. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Uh, otherwise, we have a uh, quite full agenda, and I'm happy to continue to move on. Yes, ma'am. Just for sake of being a broken record, um, you said that unvaccinated uh, people are more likely to be vulnerable than vaccinated. But the truth behind that is if you are already foundationally vulnerable, generally speaking, you have to be given the choice to get a vaccination and it may or may not make you more or less vulnerable. So it's not the science behind that is that's an opinion. It's not fact. And when people who are vulnerable continue to hear this over and over and over again from physicians and systems, um, they're not being empowered to make a decision in light of their body and their health. So um, I just I'll continue to sound like a broken record because that is uh, what the field of science is. It's a number of opinions and that should lead to choice. So, um, so I appreciate you sharing that. I would encourage any person uh, prior to getting vaccinated to have a conversation with his or her uh, medical practitioner um, and to be advised about whether there are any particular medical vulnerabilities that uh, would contraindicate their vaccination. In the absence thereof, I think the medical profession broadly writ feels that it's better to be vaccinated than not. There are exceptions, as you point out. There's no question to that, but, but to that. Um, are there any other uh, questions or comments? Dr. Pugh. I'll just make a comment um, in, for the sake of <laughs> keeping the, the broken record <laughs> moving. Um, just pointing out, you know, I, I thank you for the, the comments that you've made and making sure that the public is aware that COVID is still alive and well. Uh, we are happy to see that the rates are going down and that people are still getting vaccinated and just really emphasizing the, the use of masks uh, uh, whether or not you are or are not vaccinated. Um, the only thing that I will point out is that COVID uh, deaths during this last wave have been higher than any other of the uh, waves that we've seen. So COVID is still real, even though we are seeing the less severe um, vir uh, vari variants. Uh, but um, again, I just will reiterate the masking and the vaccine and definitely uh, doing the vaccinations under the care of a doctor. I do agree. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Snyder to you and then Ms. McMillan. And just further on uh, masking, uh, we have a student here in the state of Michigan who after a loss in a basketball game was then encouraged by a new athletic director and vice principal under a coach to participate in a practice that was significant extra kills, extra um, work as a result, forced to wear a mask, underwent hypoxemia, and is now dealing with brain damage as a result of it. We can have these updates, we can have these disagreements, but the outcome of these policies is absolutely dangerous. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Snyder, Ms. McMillan, to you. Yeah, I, you, I would just say that it would be good to also include that the science clearly shows that natural immunity is superior to vaccination, um, so I want to throw that in as well. Okay, well, that that is not the science to which I'm. Familiar. It is this. Okay, okay. it is a science that's clear. Ha happy to have you state that, but I'm not happy to have it be put on in my mouth. Are there? Any I'm not other, trying to put it in your are mouth. There, are there any other questions? I'm just trying to state the facts. I'd like to clarify, it's not the science you're choosing to base the policy and your monthly updates on, but okay. it is science. Any other questions or comments from board members? Thank you very much. Um, the next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is presentation of Fall 2021 Child Care Stabilization Grants. This presentation is an overview of the Fall 2021 Child Care Stabilization Grants funded by the American Rescue Plan Act to stabilize and support child care providers. This is an informational presentation and no board action is required. We welcome our presenters who are joining us via technology. Dr. Scott Kenichnik, Deputy Superintendent of P20 System and Student Transitions, and Ms. Lisa Brewer Walraven, Director of the Office of Educate of, uh, of Child Care Development. Uh, 
presenters. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. Welcome. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rice. <clears throat> and thank you to the State Board of Ed for giving us the opportunity to provide an update on uh, the round seven of our child care stabilization grant. So we, we're calling this round the fall 2021 child care stabilization grant. Um, if you follow child care and child care funding, uh, the federal government uh, appropriated about $1.4 billion to the state of Michigan, which was then appropriated through um, our own state budget. Um, and that happened in early October. Um, given that uh, given that approval or appropriation, Lisa and her team and many external partners went to work um, and have since processed almost 6,000 grants to child care providers, totaling a little bit over $350 million. Um, it, uh, in the presentation, Lisa certainly is going to share some thanks to folks. I want to thank people as well. Um, prior to that, this was really a Herc Herculean effort. Um, in getting the dollars to providers in a timely manner. So thank you to Lisa, thank you to her team, um, and thank you to uh, the many partners that she's gonna reference here in a little bit. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to Lisa. She's gonna provide some more details to you around this round of grants. We'll hear from a provider who uh, received some of these dollars and what these dollars did for um, her childcare um, 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 business. And then Lisa will talk about next steps. So Lisa. Thanks, Scott. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having us this morning to, to share about this uh, great opportunity that we were able to work on to get funding to providers. Uh, in Michigan, we want to make sure that all families have access to safe, quality, affordable child care that meets their needs regardless of how old their children are, where they live, what their family income is, or what their race or ethnicity is. And throughout the public health emergency, it has certainly spotlighted the critical role that childcare plays in supporting children, families, businesses, and the economy as a whole. Childcare is essential for communities to thrive and for individuals to be able to return to work. So we've been really working to ensure that we're reducing stresses that the pandemic has caused in the child care market. Uh, parents and families are having trouble finding care that meets their needs. Programs are having trouble staying open because they're not able to find staff to meet the needs. So these grants or these opportunities have really presented an opportunity to rebuild that child care system to support children, parents, and providers to have the access to care that they need. We engaged an uh, enormous amount of stakeholders throughout the process of developing this round of grants, and they were really critical in terms of us being able to be successful. They helped us develop an equitable funding formula. They helped us identify ways to simplify and update our application process. Uh, they helped us translate materials to ensure that all providers had access to information. They increased our capacity to provide technical assistance and support with the submission of applications. And they helped us review grant applications so that we could get payments to providers in a timely manner. Um, so again, without their support, this big effort would have been really impossible for us. In addition to the child development and care staff within the Department of Education who have supported the ongoing grant work across all of the rounds, we had numerous partners. And this is a visual to show you how enormous the support was from stakeholders across the state to help us meet our goal. Uh, we could not have been successful without this entire team. Uh, and partners working together. Um, some of them are joining us virtually today uh, to get that uh, thank you uh, through this presentation. A few are in the room, but I wanted, like Scott, to definitely say a big thank you mm. to every entity that you see represented here or in the room or who is participating virtually. We could not have developed the application, reviewed all of the applications, completed our reporting, 
or gotten to all of the providers without your help. So everyone on here was a tremendous asset to this work. We wanted to share a little bit of the grant data with you just so that you could see the impact that this has had in the child care industry. Scott already mentioned, uh, but we did award over $365 million in grants um, to uh, 5,890 licensed child care providers across the state. Uh, and we learned a lot from this application process, and that's what I'm hoping to share with you this morning. So here's the data on the grants that were awarded. You can see that out of 7,926 licensed providers across the state, we received applications from 5,910 providers, or about 76% of the providers who were eligible. This gives you a visual snapshot of how many grants were awarded in our four early childhood uh, support network regions that we uh, divide our work up across the state. So it shows you by provider type by the region, as well as the average grant awards that went to each of those provider types across the state. A big piece of our application process was to ensure equitable access and to support providers who were serving children that are low income or may have care that is typically harder to access or find. So we had bonus categories and these demonstrate those bonus categories and how many providers answered yes to meeting this need for children and families. So we were focused on care for infants and toddlers, uh, children who receive child care subsidy, uh, children uh, who have uh, special needs, offer uh, non-traditional care hours, and participating in Great Start to Quality, which is our quality rating improvement system. This was also an opportunity for us to gather some information about the early childhood workforce. We definitely have a shortage in terms of the number of individuals who are coming back and working in programs. What that means for children and families is that programs that are open are open for fewer hours and they may not have as many of their classrooms open Therefore, they're not able to serve as many children and families as they have in the past. So we wanted to take this opportunity to learn about the number of staff who are currently working, as well as the vacancies that exist. Um, so this grant opportunity award, awarded bonus dollars uh, for those who are currently working and allowed for programs to request funding for vacancies to help fill those vacancies. So we have about a 20% vacancy rate for full-time staff and a 34% vacancy for part-time staff. With those reductions in the number of hours that programs are open or the limited classrooms that are open, we're starting to see waiting lists. That means that again, families are not able to access or locate care that meets their needs. Um, so we're going to continue to work on strategies for helping to reduce these wait lists. The Office of Child Care, which is uh, the office at the federal level where our funding comes from, identified these 10 counties as our areas of highest need. And we are going to be reporting back to the Office of Child Care about the grants that have been awarded in these oh specific counties. Overall, 58% of our grant funds were awarded in these 10 counties. Again, you can see the type of providers that those grant funds went to and the total dollar award of those grants. Uh, Scott mentioned that we have a message from a child care provider who actually received these funds. 
Uh, this program is a program that is participating in Great Start to Quality or is star rated and is a nonprofit early learning center that was formed in 1984 uh, by innovators at the department in the Lansing School District. From its location near downtown Lansing, uh, EC3, which is the name of the program, currently serves 105 children from 90 families in the greater Lansing area. Its infant, toddler, and preschool programs operate within 10 classrooms and its staff of 44 includes 27 full-time professionals, 15 who have been with the program for more than five years. So I really wanna send out a thank you to Liz and her team for putting this clip together. As soon as the American Rescue Plan Act was signed into law, EC3 began preparing for the changes it would bring. We knew it would take some time for the Michigan legislature to finalize the appropriations, and we were thrilled that they largely adopted the MDE's proposed plan for distribution. Providers statewide, including EC3, received much needed support from the department in the early months of the pandemic, and it was evident that the MDE leadership was motivated to do right by us. Many town hall meetings and webinars later, the department issued an elegantly streamlined application process so that all Michigan early learning providers could access life-saving funding through child care stabilization grants. For EC3, these funds couldn't have come at a better time. Because of a severe staffing shortage, we had already begun to overhaul our wage structure in order to attract teachers, who might otherwise go to work for the public schools. When the staff bonus money came through, including funds to attract new hires, it really made a difference in the lives of these professionals. The grant funds have also been a godsend already to families whose children are enrolled at EC3. As COVID has closed several classrooms, we have been able to use some of these funds to enable needy families to get a break on tuition. Plans are underway to use funds towards EC3's insurance payments, necessary equipment upgrades, and much needed PPE for both staff and children. Because the MDE has worked so hard to streamline even the reporting process for this grant funding, EC3 and its contemporaries will be able to apply for the second half of funding in March without missing a beat. In turn, we will provide the continuity and stability that our children need and our families deserve. In terms of next steps, um, we are working to gear up for another round of the Child Care Stabilization Grants. Uh, we're beginning to collect reports from providers who have received grants to identify how they're utilizing that grant funding. We're providing data that we've collected from providers to the Federal Office of Child Care as part of our reporting requirements. We'll begin monitoring a certain percentage of grants to ensure proper utilization of the funds. And then we'll be re-engaging all of the stakeholders who helped us with our fall application uh, prior to the next release so that, again, we can make improvements and modifications to best support children, families, and providers. If you're interested in learning more about our county-level distribution, we do have that posted at our website where uh, you can see the link here. Uh, I encourage you to visit that. Uh, while uh, this project uh, and the round seven grants have been a really big lift, uh, we have been truly amazed to see how the field came together to support the child care industry across the state and are looking forward to that opportunity again in March to get these funds out to providers. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. 
Thank you, Dr. Kennedy-Schneck, Ms. Rule Walraven, for that presentation. Board members, any questions or comments? Uh, Ms. Lifton, thank you. Uh, that was an amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Um, it, you really hit on, I think, some important issues that um, that uh, we're hearing about in terms of the uh, the child care shortage. So thank you so much for that. Um, a question that I have is, um, if in fact um, the, all of the centers that you've identified um, are able to fully staff themselves? In other words, find and recruit the providers that you've shown gaps. Would there still be an unmet need or do we have enough of the infrastructure to actually handle all of the projected needs for the state? So I'll, I'll start maybe high level and kick it to Lisa. So um, this next round of grants, uh, I, for my, my take, the answer is no, the infrastructure is not complete yet. This next okay. round of grants is really aimed at um, um, solidifying and building that infrastructure. Um, uh, part of that is with startup grants, to, to your point. Um, and so I, I don't feel that the infrastructure is there yet. Certainly these dollars help. They're intended to help. Um, and I'll kick it to Lisa to provide um, some specifics on that. I agree with Scott. Uh, prior to the the public health uh, emergency, we had shortages in certain areas of the state in regards to care being available to families that meet their needs. So as uh, we've gone through the uh, public health emergency, we've lost some providers. So we're still trying to build back the number of providers ensure that those are operating, are operating at full capacity, and then encouraging other new providers to join in to get to cover those areas where we are lacking. So um, we still have work to do, uh, but we do have opportunities with this funding to make sure that we can help meet those needs. Thank you. And just one quick follow-up. So do you have a sense of how much uh, funding would be required to be at, you know, in a perfect world, full, full capacity uh, and where you want to be um, in terms of slots and then a dollar figure on that? Or is that just something that can't be ascertained? Um. <laughs> We have have not uh, done that estimate in a while, but I can tell you uh, it would be a very large figure. Okay. But um, certainly something that, that we think about, um, you know, part of the child care uh, industry is supported through child care subsidy dollars that the department is the lead for, as well as private pay dollars. Um, so it's a complicated formula to figure out. Great. Thank you so, so much again. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Lipton. Uh, Dr. Pugh and Ms. Snyder. Um, I think to, to uh, board member Lipton's point and then just a, a question in general, I don't know if Michigan League of Public Policy, if you all have worked with them, but I think it was them who put out some really great um, county level data mm -hmm. that, and I don't know, was that mentioned here? I might have no. missed. Oh, you it, okay? You're familiar, mm -hmm. and just wondering if you all have looked at that, and that kind of like tells uh, where the needs are, and maybe you built uh, the need here based on that. But just thoughts on how you're mm -hmm. working with that and using that as as a data point. Dr. K sure. and, and Ms. Brewer Walraven, would you like to address that? Sure. Yes, we are aware of the, the Michigan League for Public Policy data points that they put out. Uh, there's a group who uh, works closely with the department in terms of looking at the child care needs across the state. We'll be using that data uh, for the child care supply building opportunities that Scott mentioned just a few moments ago. We have $100 million that was appropriated to the department. Uh, which will be our next big effort in terms of addressing the child care shortages 
and supports that are needed for the field. Thank you. Thanks, mm -hmm. Dr. Pugh. Uh, Ms. Snyder. Uh, Lisa, just a couple questions. Uh, I'll ask one. The first one, uh, is there any language in the grants that attach <clears throat> to vaccines, masks, or the pandemic in any way? No, there wasn't. Okay. So no language in applications or uh, the foundation of the grant. It, it's all solely based on child care. Correct. Okay. Providers, to be more specific, sorry. Are there mm -hmm. any strings attached or spending guidelines for these grant dollars? So if you if you get them, you, you apply for them, you get them. Um, do you have a document you could share with us that, say, the provider gets in terms of what these dollars are used for? Yes, we have documents that are available to share that information with you, and I'd, I'd be happy to get them um, out uh, to everyone. We're following the federal guidelines that came from the Office of Child Care related to the allowable uses of the grants. Uh, so that's where we got that guidance for providers. And is there, um, so you have allowable uses for the dollars. Is there follow-up on that? Is there, what, how does that work when, when a provider gets a grant, knows the allowable uses for those dollars? Is there reporting tools like you've described in this um, in terms of being able to see that that has been used for that purpose? Yes, uh, we released the reporting templates at the beginning of February for providers who had received the grants. They have a period of time to complete those reports and spend the funds. Uh, it does ask them to tell us how they used their grant dollars. And we will be doing some follow-up monitoring on those reports that are submitted. Uh, we'll be able to look at a certain percentage of those grant awards to ensure that funds were used appropriately. Um, can you send us the allowable uses paperwork? Yes, sure. I will work to get that to Marilyn so she can get it out to all of you. Okay. Ms. Snyder, any other questions? That's it. Okay, very good. Any other uh, questions or comments from board members? I, I, Dr. Pugh, please. In follow-up to board member Snyder's um, question, you're not saying that it can't be used for those items. I think the question that that, that uh, Nikki was asking is, do they have to be uh, spent for those items or are there stipulations? Do you want me to speak to that? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess I was just assuming allowable uses means that it does have to be spent on that, meaning if it's oh. not attached yeah. to vaccines, masks, or pandemic measures, then it can't be. That's what I would assume based on what you okay. guys have just That's said. Right. Right. Okay, that, that was my understanding of the question too. If there are no other uh, questions or comments from board members, I'd like to thank our child care and development staff within the department uh, who have done a terrific job in the last two years during the pandemic. I'd also like to thank thousands of providers across the state for what they are doing, not only to help develop our young people, but help to um, really uh, re-strengthen our economy uh, as we as we come more fully out of this pandemic. So thank you to to all of you, uh, Dr. Kenick Schneck, Ms. Brewer Walraven. Thank you for your presentation. We appreciate it and we appreciate you. I'm sorry, Ms. Tilly. The benediction to you. <laughs> I just wanted to add. Um, uh, when I was younger, I was a, and I've said this, a ECE teacher at Joyland Achievement Center, and I've also talked about you know, the fact that ECE teachers only make as much as, you know, a, a, a fast food worker. Um, they really deserve to have a race, especially during the pandemic. They work so hard um, and they are so needed right now for our parents. Um, so I just think that we need to bring, and I know we're K through 12, but we definitely need to bring more attention to not just our K through 12 teachers needing raises, but also our ECE teachers <coughs> in the state. Thank you. You bet, you bet. We, we agree with that uh, with, without, uh, without any footnoting thereof. Thank you. Um, next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is presentation on the revised model asthma policy, a revision of the State Board of Education model policy on the management of asthma in schools is 
being proposed to include new evidence related to the treatment of asthma, best practices for managing asthma in schools, and new resources for school personnel, students, and families. Following a period of public comment, the board will be asked to approve the model policy on the management of asthma in the schools during its May 10th, 2022 meeting. We welcome our presenters, Mr. Thanks. Kyle Durant, Deputy Superintendent of Finance and Operations, Dr. Diane Bolzinski, Director of Health and Nutrition Services, Mr. John Dowling, Asthma Program Manager, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. Presenters, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Ison. Good morning, board. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss the revised policy with you today. Um, since the previous model, since the board's previous model policy um, on management of asthma in schools was developed and approved back in 2005, the federal <clears throat> asthma management guidelines have been updated twice: once in 2007 and again in uh, 2020. Um, so there's important resources and updates that have been developed since. 2005, which is obviously a significant amount of time ago. And so uh, those uh, changes and best practices and resources um, have been incorporated in the draft revision uh, that's before you today. And as Dr. Rice mentioned, um, we would like to take that out to public comment to ultimately bring it back uh, to the board for approval uh, later this year. Uh, we've been working closely with our partners at MDHHS and appreciate uh, uh, John's work and his team's work on, on helping to get this revision to where it's at today, and, and we'll uh, turn it over to, to John and Diane to uh, lead the presentation. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, thank you uh, for having me today to talk about the work we've been doing in terms of revising the asthma model policy. Um, and again, I'm, I'm John Dowling. I work with the asthma program. I'm the asthma program manager here at uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we're excited about these revisions. And we think these updates uh, will make this policy uh, much stronger. Um, so you could do next slide. Yep, that's it. Okay. Um, so the so the asthma program, and, and Kyle mentioned this, the asthma program uh, worked with its partners to develop the original version uh, in 2004, and it was adopted in 2005. And again, there's been no updates since 2005. Next slide. In those 17 years since the asthma policy was adopted, uh, there has been new evidence related to the treatment of asthma, best practices for managing asthma in schools, and new resources for school personnel, students, and families. Um, in two, uh, 2007, the National Heart and Blood uh, Lung Institute, or NHLBI, updated their asthma guidelines and called in the expert panel report three or EPR three guidelines. And this was a full guideline update. And then more recently, <clears throat> NHLBI has um, released the 2020 focus updates. And those just cover six areas to be used with the EPR three guidelines. So that was a partial update. Actually, sorry. Um, also, um, the school-based allergy, asthma, and anaphylaxis management program has been released, um, and this was in 2016. So the goal is to improve the health and school-related outcomes for children with asthma using school-based partnerships that focus on integrated care coordination amongst family, clinicians, and school nurses. SAMPRO advocates for components of integrated schools and specifically school nurses within the asthma care team. So they have a creation of circle of support among families, clinicians, and school nurses centered around the child with asthma, creation and transmission of asthma management plans to schools, and a comprehensive asthma education uh, plan for school personnel and comprehensive environment, environmental asthma plan to assess, remediate asthma triggers at home and school. When SAMPRO was first developed in 2016, it was specific to asthma. Uh, recently, they have added uh, the allergies and anaphylaxis piece to, to SAMPRO. Uh, and then the last, well, the last two consist, the consensus statement for the core tenets of chronic 
condition management in schools. So this outlines seven core tenets and three foundational supports for school stakeholders to establish a common framework and guide an integrated, collective, and equitable approach to chronic condition management in schools. And then the standards of care provides a consistent standard for, all, for supporting all students with chronic conditions that ensures equitable opportunity for student success. And that'll be next slide. Thank you. So the asthma program worked directly with Avilia Jankowski, the state school, um, school nurse consultant. And Avilia and I kind of coordinated the revision along with our school asthma action group. Uh, this, is, this is a group that's been together for quite a while that, that advises, advises us and helps us uh, address the school issues um, going on um, with asthma. And the action group provided content, feedback, and helped us through the revision process to the point where we have now this full update. And, and on the slide, you can see the organizations that are part of the action group. Next slide. So I want to just spend a little bit of time highlighting some of the major updates. Um, I've already mentioned the um, consistent statement and core tenets along with the standards of care document. Also, um, we strengthened the asthma education section. We provided information on specific trainings that would be available, included links within the document. Uh, we've also added some quit smoking along with, with e-cigarettes, but um, quit smoking resources were also added. And next. There's important information included on medical emergency response planning that outlines actions that will occur should a medical situation arise. It also uh, indicates specific responsibilities for members of the, of the medical emergency response team in order to provide medical care, medical care for an ill or injured student or staff member. There's improved information on medication access for those students who self-carry and those who aren't old enough or mature enough to self-administer their own asthma medication. We provide more information on triggers and included su suggestions for addressing them. And then current resources um, have been added, again, as well as links to those resources. So for next steps, again, it's, it's, um, we'll, we'll disseminate uh, the plan for um, public comments. We'll analyze those comments and feedback, and then we'll bring back uh, that information to the board for um, discussion approval. And I just want to thank you again for the time and the opportunity um, to kind of share this information in the, the model policy revision. And of course, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to, to respond. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dowling, uh, Dr. Bozinski, Mr. Durant. We appreciate your presentation and your leadership on this issue. Board members, Ms. Snyder? I just am curious, in terms of old standards or standards that we'll, we'll keep or standards that we're including, um, is there any acknowledgement of humidity as a trigger for asthma? Uh, I'm trying to remember, we do have a lot of triggers listed, but I will, it may not, it's a good question because it is an issue. The CDC discusses humidity as a significant trigger. Yep. The NIH acknowledges that humidity when we're wearing masks is significantly higher. So for people who have asthma, though there's a risk for the trigger with viruses, there's also a risk with humidity when they're wearing masks. So um, I think that kind of puts us back at the most important mitigation with um, COVID and our pandemic is to stay home if you're sick, especially for people, to protect people who have asthma. But again, I, I, I continue to circle back around to understanding how vulnerability really impacts each individual student and each individual. So um, I just want to know that as we think about asthma in schools and this revision, are we acknowledging that? Because it's a, it's a significant part of, of triggering asthma. And from one student to the next, it may be different. You know, your trigger for your asthma might be different than my trigger for my asthma. 
And so uh, to acknowledge it gives these students the space to be vulnerable in their unique way. Um, they may need to choose not to wear a mask. They, they may not have to. It just depends. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Other, uh, other questions or comments of state board members? But, uh, Dr. And thank you for coming. Thank you uh, for, for having this presentation. Your hair color has changed a bit. It has. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I dyed mine. <laughs> um, it, this, thank you for the presentation. I'm so happy that we're all here together having this conversation. Um, and to uh, uh, Nikki's point, um, some of the, you know, just doing that deeper um, environmental dive, uh, just making sure that we're continuing uh, to move those worlds together as well. Um, and I know that some of the things that we were looking at uh, more closely was things like um, building conditions of the schools uh, when we talk about humidity and mold and all of those factors. But um, uh, product use or an IPM, um, integrated pest management, and just wondering if you all are working with healthy homes, if you're working with like University of Michigan, um, their environment, well, no public health, but also the environment and the sustainability offices, but really hopefully coming more closely linked with the outcomes um, as well as those environmental exposures. And I know that we had started to make those linkages years ago. I saw a little bit of it in the presentation and then uh, definitely knowing that we need to connect uh, this health uh, condition that's known to be one of the leading causes of school absenteeism um, to this discussion, but also just making that, that well-rounded connection. And how is that coming, is my question. Yes. And so we do, um, at least in terms of our the asthma program and the partners we work with, that we, we're connecting with indoor air quality uh, organizations and outdoor air as well. So, um, you know, certainly we're in communications with EPA. Um, there's two Healthy Homes coalitions uh, within the state, um, so local coalitions that we connect with. Um, we, we try and connect with um, or work some with Wayne State and some of the work they're doing as well as U of M. Um, we have connections with their CAFE program um, mm -hmm. as well. So we're, we're trying to take those things in consideration because those the environmental piece is such a big one, um, indoor and outdoor, um, and, and having those considerations. So that's good to hear. I mean, I know the funding's not always there. I mean, and, and to Nikki's <laughs> point, you always want to know what new things that we introduce, what, you know, what the consequences are. Um, you know, of course, we have to introduce some things because it's an emergency. Sure. Um, but the, hoping that we have the funding and the resources and the support to be able to, um, to research and, and look at all of that stuff. But we know that this is a very important topic. So good to see that they have great people um, that are staying close to this, this issue and that we're bringing it all together. We've got some great partners that, that are involved in this. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Uh, Mr. McMillan. So does each, uh, thank you, does, does each school, are they required to have a policy on asthma? management of asthma in their school They're, currently? So this is not a requirement. No, there's no requirement. Okay. These are the okay. model policy best practices. Okay. okay, so there's not one that, that uh, they currently have to have, nor this one. Um, so this is a, if this goes through and it's approved by the state board, it's a, it's a suggestion. Correct. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, although, are there ever times when, and maybe not just the asthma policy, but where grants or funding is tied to whether or not you are implementing a State Board of Education approved policy? Um, I, okay, we they, don't have any funding that we're giving, so I, I can't speak to it from my personal experience, right. but I, I haven't heard of anything like that. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Millen. Other board members, questions, comments? Once. 
Dr. Pugh, to how, you. How has the reporting been, or how has the, at the local level, have, has, has that improved? Has that, as far as reporting and, and the management plans uh, as well? From the local level, one of the things that has, has happened over time is we've lost a lot of the asthma coalitions. So it used to be um, quite a few years ago now, but there was a lot of local asthma coalitions who were working. And at one point, we provided funding. Um, unfortunately, cuts kind of took that away. We still tried to connect with them as much as possible. But over time, so we've lost that. Um, so it's a lot of just um, kind of trying to engage various organizations and, and look for opportunities to collaborate, connect. Um, whether it's working with schools or, or other areas. Um, so we're, we're trying to coordinate as much as we can and connect with folks. Um, but at least in terms of the local level, there's less. There is, we've got a group in Detroit that we're working with, um, the Asthma Collaborative of Detroit, that um, has been. I remember Flint used to have a big <coughs> they had a network. Big, yeah. Uh, Kent County. Yep. Yep. Um, and is this. I know we're in these last two years have been a little bit different, but do we still see asthma as like a leading cause of absenteeism? I think it's still part of one of the higher, yeah. I mean, this, this period in the pandemic has kind of changed things. There's been, there's been less uh, hospitalizations, um, ED visits. There has been some things like that, but asthma is still a big piece of it. Um, I think, you know, a lot of kids were home for a while. There, there, there wasn't the, the flus, there wasn't the colds, at least in that first year. So there was some changes along those lines. But it's still, still an issue. And I think school attendance is a big piece of this for any chronic disease. Mm -hmm. But making sure that asthma is well controlled so those kids can stay in the classroom. I would add to that, that would be why asthma is one of our metrics for our state education plan. And we have our state school nurse who is shared between our department and the Department of Health and Human Services. And she has a network of school nurses, which is growing because of the additional funding that's happening. So where there aren't coalitions, she is able to make connections with school nurses to help move this type of work forward. Dr. Bozinski mentions the metrics of the third goal of the state strategic right. education plan improving the health, safety, and wellness of our young people. And you may recall um, encouraging the addition of particular uh, metrics into that plan. Ms. Tilly as well encouraged the metrics, uh, particular metrics to be included in that plan. But there was a particular uh, interest in asthma and lead-related metrics um, during, our, during our discussion, consistent in part with this conversation. Um, thank you. Ms. Tilly, to you. Can we add on to this bronchitis, or is that too cumbersome? I, I kind of feel like as somebody who suffers from both, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand, asthma and bronchitis, or it can go hand in hand. Right. And usually any sort of virus or flu, colds um, can be triggers and in, in definitely. Um, but yeah, I think we can make note. Thank you. Yes, I would be remiss. I know. Thank you, Ms. Tilly. Thank, I know Board Member Snyder touched on it, but does this address uh, masking in pandemics? No, we of, not, of asthma. I mean, we didn't mention um, in the model policy anything about masking in relation to the pandemic. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. And just to be clear, I, I, I'm asking you to revisit that and include it. Um, I think that as we move forward, regardless of how any type of pandemic, virus, flu, or cold season is managed by whoever's in charge at the time, there can't be a mask mandate for these kids. If we want them back in school, we need to understand that this may very well be a trigger for them, um, greater than dealing with um, a virus. And so they have to be given the opportunity to choose. So I, I would really consider that based on humidity being a significant trigger for many people who have asthma. So 
So, so just a, a point of clarification. So what I thought I heard you say was the model policy was silent relative to both pandemic and masks. Is that correct? You did not mention that. Okay. And, and your suggestion is that there be a specific inclusion related to masks? I think that we should be clear at this point in time that there should not be a mask mandate for kids who have asthma. We, we, if it's imperative, if, if it impairs their ability to manage asthma, it should not be a mandate for them. We have a, we have a public comment period, mm -hmm. do we not? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. We have the opportunity to engage the public in what the model policy is currently and, um, and to get public comment on the sufficiency of that uh, model policy and whether it needs to be amended. Yeah. I would also just, again, refer back to the CDC and NIH's understanding of triggers for asthma and the humidity being significantly increased when you wear a mask. I, you know, we, we should definitely refer to that, too. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Snyder. Dr. Pugh. I would just say, you know, just for all of uh, these type of issues, we would hope that uh, children are talking to their physicians um, first and foremost. And so we don't want to put all of that onus here. Um, and then the type of research that we're talking about, definitely we would hope that the, the department would incorporate that into whatever it is that, that they're putting forward. Um, but but uh, your point uh, definitely should be um, considered and hopefully um, uh, physicians are being consulted in those situations. Yeah, always. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Anything more uh, for our presenters? Uh, if not, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Garan, Dr. Bozinski, Mr. Dowling. We appreciate your uh, we appreciate your work, and I look forward to seeing the uh, next stage in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. The next item on the committee of the whole agenda is presentation yeah. on Michigan's top ten education plan goals to provide adequate and equitable school funding. During this presentation, we will share information on goal eight of Michigan's top ten strategic education plan to provide adequate and equitable school funding. This is an informational presentation and no board action is required. We welcome our presenter today, this morning, back by popular demand. In fact, he may have been so pleased with his last presentation that he didn't even get out of his seat. <laughs> Mr. Kyle Garan, Deputy Superintendent of Finance and Operations. Uh, Mr. Garan, we welcome. We welcome. Thank you, Dr. Eisen. <clears throat> Thank you, Board, uh, for the opportunity to share uh, briefly a little bit today about um, our Goal 8 metric around adequate and equitable school funding, um, as well as give a, um, a preview of uh, the um, Governor's budget recommendation, which will be coming out shortly. Uh, so as you know, the providing equity Adequate and equitable funding uh, for schools is, is our number eight goal in our, our strategic education plan. Uh, as a, uh, to give the board a sense of what our magnitude, we've shared these numbers on previous meetings. Um, for the 2020-2021 school year, um, $19.4 billion supported public schools um, through a mixture of local, state, and federal revenue. And those are audited numbers from from that year, and uh, school districts just had to submit their um, audited financials for uh, the 21-22 school year um, in uh, uh, November. So we will have updated numbers for you at some point later later this year. Uh, in previous uh, board meetings, uh, presentations on, on this goal and, and uh, you know the metrics themselves focus on. How the state is doing or how we're doing when we compare um, to the SFS, SFRC recommendations um, as compared to our funding uh, for schools um, in the state. <clears throat> as you may rem remember, the SFRC recommended a base uh, funding amount of $9,590 uh, per student with uh, 
specific substantial additional weights for students with disabilities, uh, children in poverty, and English learners. Uh, the SFRC also recommended uh, further exploration into specific um, additional areas that the around school funding that the SFRC did not have time or resources to delve deeper into, but recognized their impact on, on global uh, broader school funding uh, and recommended additional studies in those areas. So this, this current year, uh, but this past summer, the governor and legislature agreed to uh, the following historic investment in public schools. Uh, you see um, significant uh, increases in the per pupil, uh, bringing the foundation allowance to $87 per pupil, um, uh, significant increases in GSRP funding, um, funding uh, for wraparound services, the $240 million out of districts hire uh, school nurses, social workers, counselors, and psychologists, um, increased funding early on, and uh, a beginning uh, investment uh, in the teacher shortage um, and uh, $1.67 million for uh, Grow Your Own uh, program. So that that investment, that budget, um, demonstrates the rising consciousness uh, that schools in our state are underfunded and need additional support to be able to support our students um, in a more effective manner. However, even with uh, the historic um, school aid budget last year, public education um, is still underfunded, you know, by billions of dollars annually. And we mentioned at the board table, Dr. Rice has mentioned before, six studies in six years have all come to that similar conclusion. They've come out in different ways. Uh, they're taken to account different factors, but ultimately, schools are significantly underfunded in Michigan. This is the season uh, for budget development, and that, uh, uh, the timeline here um, board, um, outlines uh, a broad overview of, of what the next few months will look like in terms of developing the fiscal year 23 budget. Um, tomorrow, uh, Governor Whitmer and uh, partners at the State Budget Office will present uh, her executive budget recommendation to a joint session of the House and Senate Appropriations Committees. Um, later on this month and in early February, uh, state agency budgets will be presented to their respective uh, appropriation subcommittees. So uh, for the department, we will be presenting in the, uh, uh, Senate, the House and Senate appropriation subcommittees to uh, detail um, the budget proposals that you know, are uh, reflective of our department of um, school aid. And then uh, in April, May, and, and in the hopefully not into the summer, the uh, uh, appropriations subcommittees will draft and act on appropriations bills that will ultimately be uh, taken up by the full uh, chamber uh, appropriations committees. Um, as many of you know that this process is more of, a, of an art than a science, and uh, these timelines are, are very broad um, because any given year they look different for a whole host of factors. High-level details of the governor's executive budget a request have been uh, reported on in the last few days, including the Detroit News article that Dr. Rice shared with the board over the weekend. So I'm going to share briefly um, some of the high-level um, investments um, that are being proposed um, in the governor's uh, recommendation. So in the area of educator recruitment and attention, um, $2.3 billion over four years um, is being proposed to recruit and retain educators and, and other school staff. Of that number, $1.5 billion uh, is being recommended for retention bonuses for support staff over the next two years and for educators over the next four years. Additionally, $600 million is being pr proposed specifically for recruitment efforts um, to be focused on uh, scholarships for future educators and stipends for student teachers, as well as for um, uh, expanding in district <coughs> grow your own programs to recruit and train teachers locally. $100 million for educator onboarding and mentoring programs, an additional $75 million for innovative approaches to addressing uh, teacher uh, retention needs um, at a local level. The Governor's budget request will also um, request that the majority of that $2.3 billion uh, be appropriated during the current fiscal year through, through a supplemental appropriation. Uh, this is a vitally important request to give districts the time to recruit and retain educators before next school year starts. Uh, Dr. Rice, as he is 
um, shared his thoughts and the need for addressing the teacher shortage over the last three months have been very focused on that we cannot wait until October 1 to be able to allow schools the opportunity to uh, have the resources needed to address the teacher shortage and we want to be able to hit the ground running as quickly as possible and give schools that opportunity again to recruit and retain educators for next school year. Um, and what we've deemed so far is ongoing operations. Um, so this is kind of a you know base every year uh, kind of funding. Uh, the governor request will um, well, the governor will request a five hundred million dollar increase in the Per People Foundation, equating to approximately four hundred thirty five dollars per student increase. Um, if that is ultimately adopted by the legislature and signed into law, that investment will increase the Per People allocation from its current eighty seven hundred. Uh, this year to $9,135 per student, moving us closer to the SFRC recommendation for the per people allocation. A $222 million increase in Section 31A at risk funding, um, an additional $150 million for special education funding, which would um, move the district reimbursement rate from 31 to 36 percent. Uh, a slightly over $30 million increase for career and technical education programs, and then a 5% increase each uh, for funding for English learners, uh, for rural and for districts, and for intermediate school district operations. So these investments on the last two slides um, kind of underscore the governor's continued um, commitment to the SFRC recommendations. Ultimately, students, uh, different students have different educational needs, and those needs require different funding. Continued uh, investment uh, in mental health services um, and programs for students, um, $120 million increase to Section 310 funding, which um, I had mentioned earlier in the budget for the current year is at $240 million uh, right now. A uh, $50 million increase to Section 31N funding for school-based mental health services. Uh, another $150 million increase to uh, 31P funding for the TRAILS program, which is a program um, out of the University of Michigan. And also an increase um, in our funding for our child and adolescent health centers to expand the number of centers and school-based centers in our state. On the area of school safety, the governor's request will propose a $50 million uh, for school safety grants and $50 million to specifically support students who, uh, who threaten violence. In the area of early childhood programs, again, you see another uh, increase for GSRP of $56 million, a $7 million increase for early on for the early on program and a $9.5 <laughs> million dollar increase for home visitation and Great Start Collaborators. And finally, a $50 million increase for before and after school programs. So ultimately, board, this is a great education, this is a great budget proposal for education. Uh, coupled with the investments uh, this, for the current school year that I mentioned earlier, you begin to see a trend uh, that's going in a positive direction for public education funding in our state. Um, this budget request will move Michigan closer to those SFRC recommendations that our goal is, is based on and ultimately addressing the funding um, shortfalls uh, that have been well documented um, in Michigan and, and giving students and teachers, educators, the opportunity to have the resources needed to effectively support educators. And with that, I will turn it back over to Dr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Uh, we appreciate your presentation. It is an outstanding budget recommendation in the legislature. It will not only move goal eight, to which you immediately refer adequate and equitable school funding uh, within our top 10 state strategic education plan. It will move every one of the state's top 10 state strategic education plan goals. GSRP expansion, early childhood education expansion, literacy improvement, the improvement of health, safety, and wellness, the expansion of secondary school programming, the improvement of graduation rates, post-secondary credential rates, and as you spent a considerable amount of time on, goal seven 
the addressing of the teacher shortage, recruitment and retention recommendations. We appreciated being able to work closely with the governor, the governor's office, state budget office on these many proposals. They are very, very strong and they deserve uh, substantial consideration and uh, quick dispensation by our state legislature. You mentioned the urgency of addressing the teacher shortage. Not that anybody's counting, but as you are aware, <coughs> board, it's 40 days until spring. And as you are aware, board, we have called for the state legislature to act on recruitment and retention initiatives prior to the beginning of spring so that we have five months to begin to sink these initiatives into the soil of our state and to begin to have an impact on the next school year so that next year's shortage is perhaps not quite as profound as this year's shortage so that we can begin to strengthen the profession with these recruitment and retention initiatives. But we need these recruitment and retention initiatives approved in a budget supplemental. They need to be separated out and voted on in a budget supplemental. They should not wait until the summer to be approved so that they have no impact on next school year. They need to be voted on in a budget supplemental. And they need to be voted on quickly. The board is aware we put forward recommendations to the legislature in November saying the same thing. We went back to the legislature in January with nine educational organizations saying the same thing. Some people have said, well, it's 40 days. It's almost biblical, isn't it, Dr. Q? It's 40 days until spring. How can you expect them to do anything in 40 days? Well, we know that the legislature can act quickly. <clears throat> when the legislature wants to act quickly, we saw it in December. We know the legislature can act quickly when it's important. And it's important for our public schools that they act quickly to begin to rebuild this important profession in support of 1.4 million plus public school children in the state. So Dr. Uh, Albrecht, with that, uh, I'm going to uh, turn it to, to you for comments or questions. And then at the end, I'll share a couple of additional thoughts. Uh, well, I appreciate those comments, and I appreciate your presentation. It's always nice to see the, the budget recommendations boil down uh, specific to things that we're working with on a regular basis. Um, I just have a quick question. I, I, I remember when the F SFRC came out with their recommendations. How, how long ago was that? It's been a few years, right? Uh, yes. So it would have been um, January of 2018. 2018. So in 2018, the recommendation was a base funding of 95.90. Do we know what that would be when we factor in the inflation for the last four years? I do not. We would have to. We would have to calculate that number. Um, I, I do not know. I think it would be it would be helpful year after year when we come back and bring this back. At this yeah. point, it's been so long. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we do absolutely nothing, eventually we'll get to 9,500. Um, but that will not be a win. So, uh, for future reference, if 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 you could share that, that would be really really helpful. Thank you. So, so President Albert, just to your 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 point. We did that last year. And we will share that uh, with you. Um, we respect the fact that there's a chipping away at that foundation allowance by foundation. Absolutely, there's no question about that. And so we are cognizant of that, and we are tracking that. We're also in an awkward moment, right? We're right before the official release of the governor's budget to the legislature. So it's a little bit of a, a limbo land. But we make note that uh, historically, we've underfunded public education over the last several years by billions of dollars annually. And I think that's really to your to your point, to just put a number on it. Uh, it'll be easier to put that number on it uh, moving forward once the legislature passes a budget. We can go backwards and reflect upon the summer, uh, last summer. But I think it makes more sense to, to push forward. And I'm not suggesting one way or the other. I'm just saying um, that for a target, it's it's got to be a moving target because you know, it's, it's been almost four years now. So that target eventually has to 
to move. It does. The, uh, the, the, the dollar doesn't buy what it wants to buy. Correct. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, Mr. McMillan and uh, Ms. Lipton. So, uh, Mr. Curran, so how was the $5.5 billion that um, the state got recently um, used as far as, did any of that go to teacher recruitment or retention? Can we, just, can we just clarify? I just, I just the 5.5 billion that came from the feds. Thank you very much. So we are talking about the three pandemic relief packages, CARES Act, CRESA, and ARC. Yes. How much of that went to teacher retention and recruitment? Well, as you're aware, Mr. Gullon, 90 percent of that was allocated directly to school districts. So there are various <coughs> amounts that were being used to support public in those in those areas uh, directly to districts. So. 90% of that 5.5 billion was going to be two school districts. Who could have used it for teacher retention and recruitment? And some have, but they also have a pandemic that they're trying to um, navigate the bus for, and that's what those dollars were intended to be able to do. Do you know exactly sure. how that 5.5 billion has been spent or is being spent? We can tell you based on what like, they budgeted. Yes, you got to remember that we're only in uh, uh, the, the second year of the CARES money, so you got. One, two, and three, as Dr. Rice uh, referred to, um, most districts have spent through most of their uh, CARES dollars, but um, the largest of the two um, investments uh, were in Professor two and three, and those dollars are fully appropriated until um, this last summer. So districts are still using those dollars, but we can find you what they budgeted those When, because uh, I think that. Um, there's plenty of that money that could have been used, uh, and, and people are still wondering how it's being, how it has been used or will be used. I think they could use it for retention and recruitment. Um, when we add federal money and other monies, uh, how much do schools in Michigan get? Um, I mean, isn't it well over $9,500 when you add in federal monies and others? If you calculate it as a people, yes. Okay. I think even Detroit and others get well over like 13,000 or something and there in that is a, range. There is a, that spectrum is based on the needs of students in those districts. So yes, districts that have a larger concentration of students with higher needs get more federal funding. Thus, their per pupil will be larger than others. Um, and as I've said uh, in the last, I don't know, eight months, um, you know, requests by whoever looking for more funding kind of falls on deaf ears when we look at how how parents are being treated how the politicization of the classroom through CRT and other uh, other strategies of the left are being implemented uh, the mask the harm done by masking of, of kids um, the um, the outrageous amounts of money that uh, parents are being charged for FOIA just to know what their schools are doing. You know, the, just the, the real hostility of many uh, in the education community towards parents. Um, I don't know why anything should be passed quickly um, until those, uh, those issues are addressed. I would hope that, that there wouldn't be a supplemental that goes through until uh, we stop the politicization, uh, which is also causing teachers to leave. Um, and so we know that for a fact. Um, so I, you know, we know that these funding, these so-called funding studies are all done by organizations that never show a, uh, a state has good funding. I mean, they, it's pretty well known what their result is going to be before, uh, before it's even published because you just look at what they do. They're organizations that uh, come up with they need more money. I will say that funding per pupil is going to increase uh, just by math because as uh, the hostilities and these politicization continues, people are pulling their kids out of school, so the denominator is going <coughs> down um, and will continue to go down. So, you know, the, num the amount per pupil is going to increase just because you're you know, the, the system is um, pushing families to start homeschooling or finding other other methods because of, uh, of all the problems that are being, are not being addressed. So yeah, I, I hope that the legislature 
we'll make sure those are addressed before uh, any kind of supplemental because uh, throwing additional money into a system that is hostile uh, to many parents and is became, becoming more and more politicized is not something that I think would be wise. Uh, thank you, Mr. McMillan. Uh, President Albrecht and um, uh, Ms. I think Ellen was next. I beg your, I beg your oh. pardon. You, you're right. Ms. Lipton, Ms. Tilly for a first bite at the apple, and President Albrecht. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for the, the presentation. I would just like to clarify uh, a few points. As the sponsor of the bill, when I was in the legislature that kicked off the initial study that resulted in the 2016 School Finance Research Collaborative, I would like to clarify and point out, has been some years that it was a study that was initiated by the legislature. It was voted on in a bipartisan by the legislature. Many of members who are still in the legislature today, Senate. So the notion that this was some number that sky is a mischaracterization of the report initially. Secondly, the legislation that called on the costing out study to take place over a two-year process was tied to a, an expectation by the legislature. So for anyone interested who would like to read the statute, it was based on outcomes. So again, the purpose of the study was to give people information on what are the true costs to educate a child in Michigan based on the standards set forth in the school code as to what a child who graduates from Michigan should know. So the dollars are based on outcomes that the state board and others have adopted as to the Michigan Merit Curriculum. So again, the notion that the money that was, or the funding that was set forth in the study and confirmed multiple times over multiple years dropped from the sky is an untruth. That is some historical background because it's always important to know where we came from so that we can know where we're going. So that's on that piece. My question right now is, as to the teacher um, and recruitment issue, which is reaching near crisis proportions in this state, in your opinion, do we have the infrastructure in place so that if, in fact, the legislature does do the right thing and pass the supplemental appropriation, um, do we have the infrastructure in place to deploy those dollars quickly um, in time for the upcoming school year? Because that is something that concerns me, that um, that once the money gets appropriated, do we have, do the school districts have the tools in place to, um, to actually make a dent in this teacher uh, uh, shortage 
uh, problem. So thank you, Ms. Lipton, for, for sharing that, that history with us. Uh, you point out the funding of the first school finance study was appropriated by the state legislature, of which you were a member. In fact, uh, you're not the only uh, person on the state board who was a member of that state legislature when the state legislature approved that funding for that first school finance study, which would ultimately be the second state finance study because the Upjohn Institute study would be, uh, would be effectuated in the interim. That would be the second state funding study once it got finished. The third state funding study, as you may recall, was uh, former Lieutenant Governor uh, Callie's state funding study associated with special education funding. Uh, the fourth was the School Finance Research Collaborative study. The fifth was the Michigan State University study. The sixth was the Ed Trust Midwest study. So only one of the six was done by uh, people who are um, what was was generated at least initially by people from from outside of the the state. It is true that the study to which you refer ultimately would be done by people from out of the state, but it emanated from the 148 people in the state legislature. To your question about infrastructure in local school districts, the sooner that the legislature acts, the sooner that local school districts will be able to move on some of these more substantial initiatives, which is why we need relatively quick action. There's infrastructure that will need to be set up in individual school districts with respect to grow your own programs. Some local school districts, to Mr. McMillan's earlier point, have uh, existing grow your own programs inspired by the work of the Michigan Department of Education and our Office of Educator Excellence, inspired by work that's been, uh, done organically and locally. Uh, but some do not. Many do not. Um, I've been drum beating around this theme since I was state superintendent. More and more superintendents are engaged in this way. Grow your own programs for students to become teachers. Grow your own programs for support staff to become teachers. But there's a lot of work that needs to continue to, to take place. And we don't need a budget being approved with the recruitment and retention initiatives in the deep summer such that we miss another year's worth of impact for our school children. Uh, Ms. Till, thank you, Ms. Lipton. Ms. Tilly, to you, and then to President Albrecht. There's a lot of data to support that uh, where, where the per pupil funding needs to be here in Michigan, and that we have not been, been there. Um, there's a lot of national studies that says how much it costs to educate a child. Um, so, so we have plenty of data. I think a lot of us have done a good job at this table um, beating that drum of saying we need more funding for our, our school. And I, I'm very happy with um, the fact that our governor is increasing it. I, I'm very happy with you beating that drum and speaking with the governor so that we can get more um, funding for our students. There's no, cure, you know, one answer for every school district. There's no one answer for every student. So we can't say that because one group or one population of parents or students get one thing, that that's the, the cure for the whole state. When I was in undergrad and when I was in grad school, I worked as a substitute teacher at least 15 schools, Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County. I got a chance to see firsthand our students not having enough books, our students' not, needs not being met, the infrastructure in some of the schools that needed to be fixed. We know that there's an issue in Detroit where they can't they don't have the money to allocate towards infrastructure because of everything that happened in Detroit. 
Every district has different issues and different needs. This can help them to meet some of those needs. And they get to decide. That's the great thing about it. We don't have to sit here in an ivory tower and decide for them what happens in their district. They get to decide what their needs are according to the superintendents, the students, the principals, the teachers, the parents, they can, the school board members locally, they can all come to, together and decide what needs to happen to make sure that the children in those districts are adequately taken care of. Not us. It's, it's not up to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kelly. Uh, President Albridge. Uh, so that was a great segue into what I was going to say, which is when you throw a question out to the world, somehow the world sends an answer back. So I already have the answer. The updated number from SFRC is $10,421, which is an $831 increase in the recommended per pupil amount based on inflation. And then a, rec a reminder that there were two areas that the SFRC still needed to be studied. One is transportation. The other is capital needs. And uh, I believe the transportation study is underway now and hopefully funding will be available for capital needs because we know that there is, that is one area that um, uh, we do not have equity uh, in this state because it is based on, um, on uh, local dollars um, in many cases. So. Um, I just wanted to share that the answer is, is and that's how much per, per student? 10421 I mean, and what was that, an increase? I'm sorry. $831. Okay. So, so a couple of notes to that, because um, if we're going to go down the rabbit hole, we might as well go down the rabbit hole. Um, so that's base funding. That does not include the needs over and above that base funding. As Mr. Grant noted, Different children have different needs, different needs, different costs. So a child with disabilities, with a disability, is going to have more expensive needs, and we need to fund those needs. A speech-only child with disability, that's to say a child with a speech disability, is not going to have the same cost to meet his or her needs as a child who may have uh, severe cognitive challenges, for example, or severe emotional challenges. I share that because the SFRC talked about not simply the base funding to which you refer, but those needs over and above the base funding. Poverty, disability, English learner status, uh, and the three areas that needed additional study. You point out transportation and capital, but also higher poverty, not simply run of the mill, but, but more substantial poverty. And each of those three areas needs to be additionally studied, um, noted the SFRC. So, so I just share that. I think this is a, a rich area, no pun intended. Um, there, there's a lot of detail in it, um, and, and quite frankly, the fact that we're having this conversation is terrific because 10 years we were not in this state. 10 years we were pre any sort of school finance study in the state of Michigan, and there has been an increased awareness that we underfunded public schools and public school children for many, many years in the state, and we reaped what we sowed. Um, Ms. Tilly and then Ms. Snyder. I forgot to ask you, I wanted to uh, add the special needs children, definitely. There's also um, children that suffer from the achievement gap. When children in urban, urban areas graduate, they're four years behind their counterparts in the suburbs. They need additional assistance. Then they also have a lot of learning loss. We talked about learning loss during COVID, but there was always learning loss in the urban areas. There's learning loss every summer. So we, they need additional funding. It's not just let's go to school. Um, we've been on track all of these years. We're talking about people that have been behind for years. They need additional support. Thank you. And, and just to note, different, different districts have different needs as well because if you're transporting children in a densely populated area, your transportation costs are very small compared to what they would be 
in a broad, sparsely populated rural jurisdiction, in which case your transportation needs, costs are going to be greater. This night is you. Finally, my point of order. Thank you. Um, let me start with special education. I think we need to switch the way that we fund special education. Oftentimes what you hear frequently is money should go to schools. But in this particular unique area, money really needs to start to go to students so that an impact can truly be seen with those dollars and tracked in a unique way that uniquely relates to, I'm going to say it one more time, the unique needs they have. So I do think that that is something we need to see in the future. Um, setting that particular study aside in this overall discussion. As far as current funding and inflation goes, there's been a lot of discussion about it, but there are other uh, numbers that need to be infused into the discussion. So even with the $10,421 per inflation, which will return to inflation and the impact that it's had on these numbers, um, we have districts in the state of Michigan that relate to the unique needs that you guys are all discussing in depth that still receive that much more in base funding. We have districts that are getting 88,200 8, or less than base funding. And then even for those districts that are getting more than the base funding that, that Cassandra is suggesting um, relates to the inflation that we don't see in this budget that has been presented. Um, there's federal funding above and beyond that and grant funding that, as Tom mentioned, gets us to the point where we're looking at somewhere eighteen dollars to $20,000 per pupil in those districts. So your discussion is, is repetitive, it's, it's circular, the money is there. It's the districts that aren't even getting the base funding that the SFRC recommends, let alone adjusted for inflation. So we continue to hear discussion of those districts that have the unique needs don't have it there are tons of districts that don't even have the base funding that this old study suggests. And um, it's not the districts that we're, that we're talking about. So we'd have to really put that on paper and see it to understand it. We keep hearing the same narrative, but the numbers and the actual facts don't actually line up with that narrative. Um, further, when it relates to inflation, we've seen inflation rise by 6.9% in the last year and since 2018 or I'm sorry, 20. We've seen inflation in our state 6.6% in the last year. So who's, who's in charge of that inflation? What's actually happening there? And that's something Biden has re repeatedly said he's going to do something about. So I'll just say there's money within that, that problem he's trying to handle. Um, so before we even go there in terms of adjusted for inflation, you have to wonder where is that inflation coming from? Under what leadership are we experiencing that? And what are they willing to do about it? <clears throat> so those are the questions I would, I would ask that. But lastly, legislature. You've referred to the legislature not acting, not acting, not acting. Um, what is the inference in, in, in that discussion? And what are they, uh, are they asking for needs? What is the discussion they're having with you? What is Essentially, what are they saying? What is the negotiation they need to experience? What topics are, matter to them within this entire discussion? Because you can hear they're not acting, but what's behind that? Where, where is that beat? Where is the pulse on that conversation? So a few things. First of all, the, the minimum foundation allowance for the state um, is $8,700. There, there is no district with a lower minimum foundation allowance than $8,700, to which you add um, additional funding, 31A funding, special education funding, um, federal dollars, Title I Part A, IDEA, and, 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 and. So, so I, I, I make that, that's number one. Number two, we've spoken extensively about the needs of a wide range of districts. We invited um, ISD superintendents from the Western UP to share uh, their needs in a sparsely populated uh, rural corner of the, the state. So I don't think that we ignore the needs of rural jurisdictions. Moreover, I'll be meeting with uh, a group of ISD superintendents and LEA superintendents, higher education leaders from the UP tomorrow. So we're certainly not ignoring uh, the needs of our rural jurisdictions in the state. So that's one thing, too. It's not that I said that the legislature wasn't asking. You said that. What I said, rather, was that the legislature does need to act. We know that it can act 
quickly when it wants to. We're asking it to act quickly now on recruitment and retention initiatives. We believe these initiatives require precipitous action, quick action, and not delayed action such that we don't have an impact on next school year. We've had a number of conversations with state legislators. We'll continue to have those conversations with state legislators now that the governor's budget is going to be released tomorrow. There'll be hearings on the, the budget. There'll be one-on-one -on -one and small group meetings. We're hearing good feedback across the aisle on many of these initiatives. I mean, the proof is ultimately in the pudding, Ms. Snyder, and we'll see what, what the pudding looks like. But I can tell you that we've had some very, very positive feedback on recruitment and retention initiatives from both sides of the aisle. I think there's a, a real strong understanding that we're no longer in a buyer's market for teachers. We're in a seller's market for teachers. And when you're in a seller's market, you have to incentivize in a different way than when you're in a buyer's market. Um, yes, back to you. I'm not suggesting that we are ignoring any particular um, area of the state, just making inferences from the numbers that are here. With that said, um, also not opposed to the discussion or the importance of educator uh, recruitment and retainment. I haven't heard you tell me what the conversation is sounding like with the legislature. I'm hearing you repeat that we need to act right away, right now. But I want to understand what conversation they're having with you, because you're repeating your side, or our side, if you will. Um, but what are they saying about this? Why have they not acted yet? Why do you, let's, let's have that discussion. If there's been a number of conversations, what does it sound like from their end? It really turns on the individual legislator. We're getting legislators that are very supportive of particular initiatives relative to recruitment and retention. For example, we have a recommendation before the state legislature to address the reciprocity law, to make it easier to remove regulatory barriers to come into the state with a teaching certificate from another state. And what we'd like to do, what we've encouraged the legislature to do, is to amend state statute, to amend state law, to permit a person with a certificate in another state with three years of positive evaluation from another state to come into our state and get teacher certification without having to take the amputation. We think that there's a value to that. We think that if you've demonstrated your capacity to teach, you've got your certificate, you've got three years plus of positive evaluation in another state, we want to invite you in with fewer regulatory barriers than more. Each of the last five years, you may recall, we've had more than a thousand people be certified with their initial certification from the from another state. Last year it was 1,326 people. 31% of our people whom we certified to teach in the state were initially certified elsewhere. That's good news, but we can do better than that. And in the short term, that's a big deal. In the short term, that's a big deal. Now, midterm, long term, that's not the answer. But in the short term, when we're trying to address a pipeline and a profession now, that is a big deal. And when I was up in the Western UP, a part of the state that, that you know well, this was one of the things that we discussed, and we discussed fairly frequently. I recently met with Senator McBroom and Rep. Markham from the Western UP, and they shared much the same thing, that reciprocity is important, and reducing those regulatory barriers would be a help. They're supportive of initiatives to improve the teacher pipeline up north. Where we talked about it being not precisely, but too much like a one-legged stool, too dependent on Northern Michigan University. So again, it really turns, there are 148 members of the legislature. Everybody has a different lens and a different set of reflections. And everybody has a different reflection on our recommendations, and by extension, the recommendations that the governor has as well. But I can tell you that in general, people appreciate that it is not 2005. It is not a buyer's market anymore. It's a seller's market. And we have to incentivize in a different way in the seller's market. So I'm hearing and understanding that reciprocity is an important thing um, from, from your perspective and many others. What is, what are their ideas of recruitment and retention? You have to ask them. 
Thank you. Ms. Tilly and then Dr. I, Pugh and then I, Dr. Pritchett. I just I wanted to quickly. Um, I, beg I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. I did not mean to. to you know what? I, it's okay. Leah. Don't worry. No, no Leah. No, I, I did not mean to ignore our, our teacher of the year at all. Let's okay. go. Let's go. 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 No Ms. worries. Ms. Tilly, Ms. Porter, Dr. Pugh, Dr. Pritchett, Ms. Tilly. I just wanted to quickly speak about the piece with inflation. I, I thought that was really good that Cassandra brought up that point about um, adding in the cost for inflation. That's something we hadn't discussed before or thought about before. Um, and it is very important. And as far as Nikki's comment about inflation, that's macroeconomic. Inflation is going to happen every year. Um, the circumstances with COVID caused an increase of inflation to be this high. Um, but it, it, it's because of the government spending. Uh, under the Trump administration, we had to spend a lot of money. People needed um, unemployment benefits. Um, they were giving out checks to, to help people because they weren't working. So all of that helps to play a part. We had the issues in the supply chain, and then you have supply and demand, which helps to increase inflation. So. Um, I don't really want to get back and forth into the national politics of it, but just to to explain more so of that's what's going on with inflation right now. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Porter, Dr. Pugh, Dr. Pritchett. I just wanted to share that uh, hearing this presentation gave me um, real hope for the potential and the possibility of the future for public education in this state. As someone who has walked in a school for the last 16 years and watched resources strip away in creative ways of continuing to provide the best education for students because we didn't have the dollars. Uh, watching specialists not be replaced and people working across districts and in different positions because we didn't have the finances. Seeing what is presented here does provide a lens of hope for me in a way that I haven't felt in a long time. The last two years specifically, when we're talking the last 10, were already challenging. The last few years of the pandemic have been the most challenging of my career, and I would argue any educator would say their careers. And um, knowing that retention and recruitment are the top priorities. Dr. Rice, thank you for saying that that needs to be done urgently. Um, the retention is critical. I know board member Lifton shared her concern. I am also very concerned about the retention of teachers and knowing that we need to do that, and we need to do that as quickly as possible. In all the places I've been this year already, the educators we have in this state are dynamic, caring people. But we need to make sure that we are using both lanes with both recruitment and retention, giving them both the same weight, because I fear that if we do not act soon, that we're going to be in our darkest days to come. So I don't mean to end on a... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pugh, Dr. Pritchett. Um, thank you, uh, Kyle, for this uh, presentation and for breaking things down for us in the way that you have. And uh, of course, we're excited about uh, this bold step forward um, in making sure that Michigan uh, moves itself up from the bottom uh, as to how we fund our schools. Um, I, I'm like uh, you, uh, Ms. Porter. I don't. I, I'm gonna probably get right into the middle of. Um, a downer note, and that's in talking to educators and hearing that, yes, the funding is definitely needed. Uh, we know that. Uh, but we also know um, that there is a deliberate attack on Michigan's public education system. And we know that there is this push to dismantle uh, our public education system. There's a disrespect of teachers uh, and just a total um, devaluing of the profession that we know that we also have to address um, immediately uh, as well. And some examples that I would give, you know, when we talk about uh, curriculum, um, censorship, um, requiring teachers, telling teachers what they can and cannot uh, teach, asking teachers to over-report, um, I've talked about safe and healthy school environments, and we've talked about this 
hopefully being an opportunity for us to create that uh, in these schools. But we can talk about policy where we're talking, uh, where we've talked at this table about um, evaluations and evaluations that are of teachers that's driven by um, just uh, too much testing. Um, so I think that those are things that we will also continue to discuss and I want to make sure that educators in Michigan know that uh, those things have to also uh, be acknowledged and addressed as well and uh, you know I hope that we will all continue those conversations as we're also talking about uh, adequate funding um, of our teachers and different ways that we're looking to to retain them but basically making sure that we're continuing to to uh, undergird them and, and support them in this environment that we're in where they feel that they are under attack. <laughs> you have teachers that feel like they're being blamed for a pandemic um, and, and it's not their fault. You know, they're going into schools, they want to teach, they want to be inside of school buildings, but they want those school buildings to be healthy and safe for their children. Um, so I just wanted to um, bring those points up as, as uh, we were talking um, in some of the conversations that we've had uh, definitely uh, reminded me of some of these issues that I continue to hear from, from educators. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Dr. Christian. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to commend the governor, the governor's staff, and obviously Michigan Department of Education. This is a great start. Um, I have been um, an observer and actively involved in the budget process for years and so I understand that this indeed is the first step and there will be lots of conversations, lots of meetings, etc. I am pleased to know that the initial conversations, especially about teacher retention and teacher recruitment are positive. I think uh, the time has come. I think everybody realizes that. Uh, my only request at this point is as the reams of paper start to come out with all of the details and then other um, um, give and take on the budget that um, maybe if we could be kept in that loop so we're aware of the fact that, and I'll use GSRP as the example, you know, where are we at with GSRP as far as what's the final number um, possibly going to look like or where, you know. Um, and I know uh, Senate Fiscal Agency usually does a nice job of giving us the different columns, you know, the House is here, the Senate's here, the Governor's here. Even those types of updates, I'm not saying the Department has to do them, <coughs> would be uh, a request that I would have. It just helps us, I think, stay current so that we are aware of where we are in the process as it goes through uh, from this point forward. So, thank you, Dr. President. Uh, President, President, uh, President Albright. Uh, oh, that's, 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 oh, I'll, I'll be very quick. Ms. Lipton, very briefly, and then we'll then we'll get it. Yep. No filibuster, please. Absolutely not. Uh, just a. There are a few questions that were raised at the table, and I think some of these are actually addressed in the SFRC. So I would like to recommend that since it has been so long since we've had a presentation, maybe we consider bringing them back to uh, update the board. Very good. Thank you so much. Mr. McMillan, thank you. Since uh, the chairman called me out as one of the members of the legislature in 2014 that, uh, that the legislature voted to fund that uh, study, um, I was there. Uh, it was about 4 o'clock in the morning when the vote occurred, maybe 5 o'clock in the morning on the final day. The Republicans needed two-thirds vote, so they needed Democrats in order to put a large tax increase on the ballot, which of course I opposed. Uh, so the Democrats basically could call whatever they wanted. They chose this study. They wrote the law. I remember uh, Dylan from the West Side, Representative, uh, was writing it such that only one firm could actually qualify. Uh, that was how uh, detailed the legislation was. And he knew, and based on the fact that since 2001, every study that this uh, Auglin Blick put out always came to the same conclusion, more money needed to come out of the pockets of taxpayers. So he knew, and the Democrats knew, that what the study was going to show, um, they had the 
you know the republicans that were supportive of this tax increase for roads on the hook and at four or five o'clock in the morning that's when it was voted on so i just wanted to clarify the history there it was a foregone conclusion how that study was going to go and uh anyway okay thank you very much miss lipton uh to you for a uh a brief closure uh yes um we actually voted on many things um at wee hours of the morning uh that were put on um by the uh, majority party and having served on appropriations um i was uh, also forced to vote on uh several hundred page budgets um with basically nothing more than uh, a minute or two's notice so that is the life um and plight of a state legislator um and that is uh what uh, those of us that ran and served signed up for um on the issue of just a little more historical perspective brief, um brief, brief historical perspective. <laughs> yeah i would just like to share that when i was in the legislature um when we saw some of the greatest cuts to the school aid fund that the state has ever seen we saw a mass export of teachers to other states that poached um, our teachers and i would say um that uh, our teachers are some of the best prepared in the country i would put our teachers up against the teachers of any other state um, and if uh, dramatic cuts force many of our teachers to leave it stands to logic that dramatic increases um in teacher recruitment and retention um would bring them back um and uh we would be proud to have our excellent teachers back um as uh as many of them were forced to leave the state in the lean years thank you Ms. Lipton. mr I, chairman one I, really quick question um, one really quick question I, if i could please if i could my sentence Ms. Lipton, thank you for sharing that i agree with you i'll put michigan teachers up against any of the country go ahead please to 500 million dollar ask um, in relationship to the resolution last week last month on top of the 2.3 billion dollars in this budget great question so so the governor's budget includes many of those future recruitment and retention recommendations that we shared it also adds to it retention bonuses of which we are enormously supportive retention bonuses for teachers and support staff so thank you very much for that clarification. I think that was really important. Uh, board, that was a very rich one-hour conversation. Thank you so much, Mr. Duran. Thank you. Uh, the next agenda item is approval of the proposed standard for the preparation of middle grades and high school science teachers. The proposed standard for the preparation of middle grades and high school science teachers were presented to the State Board of Education on October 12, 2021. These standards would replace the current Michigan standards for the preparation of secondary teachers in the areas of integrated science, biology, chemistry, earth and space science, and physics. This update would inform program development and continuous improvement efforts in Michigan educator preparation. Board approval of the standards is being reflected today. If there is anyone in the room who would like to offer public comment on this specific item before the vote. Please complete a public participation form and give it to Ms. Schneider immediately. We welcome our presenters, Dr. Delta Chapman, Deputy Superintendent of Educator, Student, and School Support, Ms. Leah Green, Director of the Office of Educator Excellence, and Ms. Darcy McMahon, Higher Education Consultant in the Office of Educator Excellence. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. Presenters, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rice, and good morning, State Board of Education. We appreciate the opportunity to return today. Uh, we were here in the fall, in the month of October, presenting our proposed standards, which are specific to science, middle grades, and high school teachers. Our focus and intent today is to share with you the outcome of public comment, which is a process of this proposed process. We also will share next steps to occur upon board approval. Joining me today are Director Leah Breen and 
higher education consultant, Darcy McMahon, and I turn it over to them at this time, lady. All right, uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for including this work on the agenda today. Uh, we are here to share with you proposed revised standards for the preparing teachers of middle grades and high school science. We present these teacher preparation standards seeking approval by the State Board of Education today. There are many reasons why science teacher preparation standards uh, were determined to be the next critical step in our revision process. As you can see on the slide, the work is part of an ongoing process that began with revision of the certification structure into grade bands. Important MBE initiatives, such as understanding and meeting the needs of the whole child, a focus on equity, and goal number seven of Michigan's strategic education plan, have also driven a need to revise these standards to line up with these goals and initiatives. Finally, the current standards are almost 20 years old, and Michigan K-12 science standards and the NSTA teacher preparation standards have both been updated in that 20-year window. A subcommittee of stakeholders developed a structure for the science endorsements based on consideration of the certification structure committee recommendations, alignment with those MBE goals and initiatives, and reviewing input from across the state. For each grade band, all teachers who are prepared to teach science will earn a science endorsement. Those endorsements can then be paired with additional optional endorsement in a science subdiscipline. Multiple perspectives were represented by the 36 stakeholders, shown by the blue pins on the diagram. These directly contributed to the standard revision process. These stakeholders have role, roles and perspectives, including PK-12 science curriculum instruction leaders, professional education organization representatives, educator preparation faculty, and science content faculty, current teachers, multiple geographic regions, and all types of districts and institutions. There were also 33 reviewers across Michigan, rep, across Michigan represented by the red pens. These reviewers came from all across the state, including the Upper Peninsula, and even included five science leaders from other states. So there were 36 stakeholders, uh, plus 33 reviewers, for a total of 69 educators directly involved in developing these proposed standards. There are several shifts represented in the proposed standards. Uh, first, they are practice-based, meaning that these proposed standards integrate both science and engineering practices and also for teaching practices. Uh, they are three faceted to align with our three-dimensional K-12 science standards. The three facets of the proposed standards, science teaching practices, core knowledge for teaching science, and guiding principles for science teaching, are intended to mirror the three dimensions of the K-12 Michigan science standards of science and engineering practices, disciplinary core ideas, and cross-cutting concepts. Because research shows that teachers teach the way they have been taught, the three-faceted approach is intended to enable the programs to provide three-dimensional science learning experiences for teacher candidates. They are also equity and whole child focused. They infuse this equity and whole child principles throughout. In the framework facets, there are elements of them throughout. For example, in the guiding principles, there are two for equity, one for whole child. In the science teaching practices, equity is woven throughout. And in the core knowledge, all domains, both of them are woven throughout. Finally, the specialized content knowledge needed for teaching, for teaching science is directly aligned to the content of the K-12 science standards. This tight focus on the content needed for teaching helps ensure, ensure well-prepared beginners and enables programs to narrow the content scope to allow for expedient program completion. Some expected programmatic impact, impacts of this include more consistency in preparation for all science teachers and 
clear alignment of content and pedagogy to the Michigan K-12 science standards. Since we first presented these proposed standards to you in October, there's been a period of public comment in which all interested parties were invited to provide comment on the proposed standards via survey or to provide a letter of comment. There were 60 re respondents to the survey from 20 counties across the state. Four different letters were also submitted and were signed by 23 individuals representing 18 different education organizations, such as the Mass Science Learning Network, the Michigan Science Teachers Association, and the Michigan Association of School Super, uh, <laughs> Administration, Administrators. School Administrators, thank you. Yep. <laughs> As can be seen on the graph, the survey respondents represented many various roles and perspectives, including teachers, teacher educators, administrators, curriculum experts, and parents. Of those responding to the survey, 35% have experience working with grades 9-12, while 30% with, with grades 6 through 8, 23% with grades 3 through 5, and 7% in higher education and 5% alternative second, secondary programs. This majority of respondents are directly working with the middle grades and high school age groups. As you can see, the response was overwhelmingly positive to these proposed standards, with 82% of respondents saying that they support or support with only minor revisions this draft set of standards to prepare science teachers. No respondents said that they were against the proposed standards. Some of the positive comments included noting the benefits to districts, the likelihood of well-prepared beginners, the alignment to the Michigan K-12 science standards, the focus on equity, identity, and sense-making, and, and student-centered reasoning instead of fact memorization. From one of the letters comes the following quote. These standards will provide the guidance needed for teacher preparation programs, faculty, and staff to create coursework and learning experiences for their students. So they will be well-started beginners. The structure of the new standards emphasizes facets of teacher knowledge that are crucial for entering the teacher workforce, especially when considering the requirements of the Michigan Science Standards. Of the survey respondents who answered, 97% felt that these standards were well or mostly aligned with the Michigan K-12 science standards. Some of the comments included, um, from a teacher, <clears throat> I like that the college learning and training will match the, the standards that we teach in classrooms instead of just the content. And another, the proposed standards are wonderful for addressing the complexities of teaching science according to the vision of instruction presented in a framework for K-12 science education. <clears throat> 94% of the survey respondents felt that these standards truly represented what beginning science teachers need to know and be able to do. Some comments included, they will help new and incoming science teacher students prepare for the job at hand, not just prepare to be better at a subject. And the proposed standards for the preparation of teachers addresses the complexities of teaching and, and science and learning science using three facets. These facets move beyond the core knowledge that teachers of science must have to include the essential practices for teaching of core knowledge and the dispositions required to meet the needs of the variety of learners in their classrooms. There were three main themes in the comments submitted in the survey. Support for the standards, suggestions for re revision, and current preparation and system challenges. We've already heard about many of the supporting comments. Many of the suggestions for revisions were, were thoughtfully proposed minor suggestions, such as to reorder some of the six standards, minor shifts in wording, or needing clarification on things such as whether two standards were similar enough to both be needed, um, and on the use and need for the three faceted types of standards. <coughs> As a result of these minor suggestions, several tweaks were made, particularly to ensure that the committee's intent that teacher candidates are prepared to address equity in their classrooms and schools is clear. 
Some of the more significant revisions suggested were around ensuring the appropriate level and grain size of the standards. As a result, some significant revisions were made to ensure that, the, that physical science and physics and chemistry standards uh, are much more appropriate depth and grain size. <clears throat> Several others of the comments in this category were thoughtfully considered uh, and responded to by the committee, but were found to require little to no changes to the standards. For example, there were some comments regarding topics such as evolution and climate change. In these cases, the committee determined whether the content questions were written in a way as to be open to all learner ideas, evidence, and scientific argu argumentation, and also that they reflected the current language in other SBE-approved documents, such as the K-12 Michigan Science Standards. In the category of current preparation and system challenges, some concerns were expressed about the length, length of teacher preparation programs, the placement of science teachers, and the certification and endorsement structure. Each of these comments were addressed by the committee but resulted in no change to the draft standards. If these standards are approved, um, the, the MDE and Office of Educator Excellence Educator Prep Consultants will then begin providing communications, support, and assistance for teacher preparation programs to introduce the standards and revise their programs accordingly. Educator preparation programs will be able to submit applications for revised teacher preparation programs starting in November of 22 um, through April of 2024, which will be reviewed by teacher educators from around the state. The first candidates will, would enter uh, new science teacher preparation programs as early as November of 2023. Thank you so much for your time today, and uh, please do contact us with any questions you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chapman, uh, Ms. Green, Ms. McMahon, for your presentation. We appreciate that. If we could have a motion to move the standards, get the motion on the table, and then begin the discussion. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Dr. Pritchett with the, the motion, Dr. Pugh with the, the second. Um, any discussion associated there with? Uh, Mr. McMillan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on, I'll try to go through these pretty quickly. On page 51, um, number eight, uh, learning about your students' cultural, religious, family. So teachers need to learn about their, their students' religious background? Well, this comes from the... Um, this is infusing our core teaching practices, which are already um, adopted in use. Um, and so we've infused these in here. These are already requirements of programs. Um, and in particular, really understanding your students and their background and where they're coming from helps you to um, meet them where they are and build on what they know um, and, and begin to uh, so that's the that's the, ba the basic uh, background idea of that. Okay, um, and then and also their family. So learning about their family, um, anything that's not kind of off off limits, or just you can ask any. You know, you should know everything about the family, or. Well, I mean, just building that relationship is really important to okay. the learning that happens in the classroom. Okay. Um, now it says about, and then 8A, make intentional connections through the use of talk moves to encourage students to share with the class. What is a talk move? <laughs> That's a, yes, thank you for asking. That's a, um, a particular way of asking questions to help students to probe their thinking and elicit their understanding. Uh, so that's a kind of, it's... Okay. And then B says ensure tasks, in, which include assign, assessments and activities, are equitable for the diversity of students in your care. So what would be an inequitable <clears throat> assessment or an inequitable activity? Well, if we were to uh, ask students to complete something online uh, as homework and they uh, do not have access to, to technology at home, that would not be equitable for all students. Okay, I mean, is that 
So that's all you're talking about is just technology? There's nothing else? Oh, of course, there are many things. Students have many different kinds of differences. Can you give me another one? I can give you one. Asking students to select a, um, a book that aligns to the topic and do their own independent research when perhaps they don't have access to a library or a bookstore from which they could attain that material. And an inequi inequitable assessment? What would... Perhaps asking them to create something at home, which is very common in science, go home and create a project that meets these standards in order to demonstrate your learning and they don't have the tools or materials in order to be able to complete that project at home and that is intended to be used to assess their learning when they return it to the classroom. Okay. Um, create D is create opportunities for students to engage in diverse sense-making building on their community histories, values, and practices. What is... Um, now we're talking about science here, so uh, sense making building on their community histories. What does that mean? Well, all students, because of their, their experiences, uh, because of their background, they have their own ways of approaching a problem or bringing their own understanding. And it's really important for a teacher to understand that and be able to build on that. Um, in a way that really respects and develops and deepens uh, both their understanding and their own <clears throat> identity and their own way of being. So a concrete example of that might be for some of our students who are from mining communities in the Upper Peninsula when they begin to study geology and rock formation may have a very different base understanding and way of approaching it than an individual who has, does not have that same community experience where that is a way of life and a way of living. Okay. Uh, moving on to page 52, uh, core knowledge facet elements, uh, CKA3, appropriate and engaging learning activities that foster an inclusive, equitable, and anti-bias environment. So what would be a biased environment? So I can speak to that one too. Um, so for example, there has been research that indicates that in science classrooms, teachers often call on male students much more frequently than female students. So being aware of that propensity and ensuring that you're engaging students equitably in a science lesson would be an example. Yeah. Um, on that same page, CKB number six, it talks about example, uh, let's see. A line of alignment of instruction and assessment strategies that address students' prior knowledge and alternative conceptions to support instructional decision making and navigate tensions between alternative ideas and ways of knowing which may be derived from various cultures and canoni canonical science ideas. What is a canonical science idea? So these, these would be um, science concepts that are that have that are uh, more accepted. That have been have had a lot of evidence and research and study. Uh, that have uh, passed for, through beyond theory to more of a law sorts of uh, kinds of things. So, you know, can't uh, be questioned. Pardon me. Shouldn't be questioned. Well, I mean, do we still study the law of gravity? Yes. Do are we still learning more about it? Always in science, right? Um, and there was a prior, there was a prior idea of gravity or of many <clears throat> things that Absolutely. was probably considered canonical, uh, and then and then was challenged. Sure, Absolutely. Okay. Um, and then on page fifty four, I couldn't figure out some of this stuff here. Um, science for all. Teachers are guided by the value that. Uh, let's see, is it one? Yeah. That all students have a rightful presence in science. A, science is a culturally mediated way of thinking and knowing and may contribute to and or disrupt social inequities over time. I mean, and then B, you know, what does that mean? So science is a culturally mediated <coughs> knowing and may oh. contribute to dis, and or disrupt social inequities. I mean, different cultures approach the learning and the understanding of science differently. And we, as teachers, we can bring our own understanding and our own cultural understanding of how science should be done. Um, 
and that can that can be challenging for students who explore science in different ways, also fully, you know, perfectly acceptable ways. And so there are, it's, it's bringing this understanding that culture um, impacts our understanding of science and science of culture and that they, they, they work together. And then B, a social justice orientation propels teachers to recognize and address inequities manifested in classroom practices. What does that mean? Again. So what would a social justice orientation for teachers mean? Would you like me to? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yes. So when we think of, in speaking, at, at, I am a science educator by trade. Teaching in the classroom, especially a diverse classroom, it is the teacher's responsibility to be very well adapted to what social justice is and to make sure that the students that they are contracted to instruct and educate know that they are understanding of that social um, justice realm and that they take the initiative and the time as the educator in the classroom to make sure that the students have voice and <coughs> choice in that social justice mechanism of learning science in the science classroom. So they need to know what social justice is. What is it? Can you tell me? Social, social justice would be the variance of diversities of those students in the classroom. So, and so that earlier you asked about science for all, science is for all. And so those students should have the equity and access of being socially adept and know what social justice is, even in the subject of science in the, in the classroom. And then finally, I've got, you know, there are things that I couldn't find in this. I found bits and pieces of some other, uh, uh, some other elements and principles that should be in there. But like, is there in here any, anywhere about how often science experts of the past were sometimes proven wrong? There are aspects of the nature of science, which I think is, is kind of what you're getting at there. Okay. Um, there, there they're kind of woven throughout, but they are in the uh, core, core knowledge facet in particular. Um, I believe it's core knowledge A uh, or B that you'll see a lot of examples of that. Um, okay. And it's part of, if you look at the guiding principles, for example, um, this community knowledge building and the disciplinary literacy aspects um, of four and five. Um, are really all about the nature of science. Um, and then how is are there about how often theories about man-made climate or weather impacts have changed over time when it was, you know, experts always said for a long time it was global cooling and then they all said it's going to, no, we're wrong, it's global warming, and then they said, no, we're wrong with that, it's climate change. And is it addressed where they've just been wrong, uh, you know, things change? Um, yeah, the, the language that we use about, uh, about topics like that is that we consider all, all of the sides of the evidence and all the different evidence and that those are, um, that students are able to make sense of that for themselves. Okay. And then as far as the importance of not censoring challenges to current scientific theories, is that kind of dealt with in there? Uh, I think, again, that's part of the nature of science. We, we wouldn't censor challenges. Um, I mean, the society, society certainly does now, but based on based on evidence, right? And I think that's the key aspect that any evidential based uh, sense making or discussion or um, okay. that was, that's grounded in um, investigative evidence. That's what we're looking for. Okay, and then how how about where the idea that um, health and climate modeling can give bad results? You know, I mean, just bad input can create bad output. I mean, uh, again, I'll, I'll find that particular standard for you, but I, I believe that we have kept that pretty open. Okay, yeah, I think I might have found it on page 41 on that one. It touched on it, but I wasn't sure. Thank you. If you, and if you, then, if you'd bring it to a conclusion, because we do have other people who well, this like is, it. Well, this I, is I important. It's important. I know it's um, important, and I've, other people's and, questions are too. Well, we got plenty of time. We got all day. We do. How, um, how about how science's research is often influenced by politics? and large corporations like Big Pharma, I mean, is it kind of 
talk about that? Uh, no, I don't believe that that is something that we've really, uh, but we do talk about uh, generally the influence that science has on communities and communities on science understanding and how those work together. Okay, and then, um, I guess I can try to wrap it up for now, but how often there is a revolving door of personnel among government regulators and government authorities and the corporations that they regulate. Uh, is that addressed at all? Again, uh, that's not really in the, that would sound more like a political understanding piece that, that is important, but I'm not sure that's maybe my, well, more in the realm of social studies than in science. These are more about empirical, investigative. Well, I mean, but that, in, that influences science. how science is perceived and kind of what the science is often is dictated by people who have ulterior motives. Yeah. Okay. I'm all sure right, those, thank those you. topics come up in classrooms all the time. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McMillan. Uh, Ms. Snyder. Thank you. Um, just piggybacking on to a number of things that have been said. So we've talked about social justice and science. Science for all is diversity of students. They vary. We've talked about probing religion, probing um, how students think, meeting them where they're at, building on what they know. So if we really practice this, then my thought process is this. Um, we would understand that many students believe that you know creation science is real. So if they can offer evidence based on that, are they able to pass a class based on these standards? So remember, these are teacher preparation standards rather than K-12 <coughs> student standards. So these are helping teachers right. gain the knowledge and skills they need to be able to impart the K-12 standards to students. So, but you did say teachers teach the way they're taught to teach. So we're teaching them what to teach, right? So if they're then going and teaching, you know, science standards, my question is, given social justice, given diversity and our, our commitment to it, right, um, given meeting them where they're at, building on what they know, asking for evidence, can a state of Michigan student present evidence that um, creation science is real and pass um, a, a standard-based science class in Michigan? A K-12 student or a... So I think that's probably more of a question that's appropriate for the individuals that work with the K-12 student standards rather than the individuals who have created the teacher preparation standards. Um, I think that there, I mean, we have teachers that believe different values, creation, creationism versus evolution, and these were not preparing teachers to assess students on their religious beliefs. We're asking them to demonstrate their knowledge on the standards that are present here, which are focused on science investigatory constructs. So are they allowed to teach creation science if they believe in it? I think that's a local decision as to what is in the local curriculum basis versus the teacher preparation standards. I'm just saying, I mean, we're, we're talking <clears throat> about teacher preparation standards for science. So I think these, these are really important things to consider, especially as we say social justice, justice diversity, and probing them in what they think in their religion. The, if we're going to teach teachers to teach like this, we need to understand um, whether or not we're going to actually welcome and embrace the diversity of our students and the way we test them, not just the way we teach them, but the way we test them. Um, I know we're talking about teacher preparation, teachers teaching. So I think that these things, uh, mm -hmm. you know, really pondering whether or not that's, that's something we foster, that social justice aspect and diversity. Um, do we follow through with it with, with a large group of students that may not necessarily traditionally fit within the standards that, that we have? I, I would hope that uh, an outcome of these standards is that teachers are able to understand that when we when we do science, when we learn science, we don't divorce ourselves from the whole person. So people bring their their culture, their religious beliefs, those aspects um, impact and color what we understand about science. And that within the realm of science, we need to be able to um, look carefully at what is the evidence, what is the clearest evidence, and be able to discuss those things freely um, to, to come to understanding. And whether or not we all come to exactly the same shared understanding 
we need to be able to say what the evidence, where the evidence is strongest. I hope that helps. Well, I mean, I think you're saying where the evidence is strongest according to the standards that, that you're presenting, right? Not necessarily according to the, the view or the perspective or the person, which is the whole concept of there's a variety uh, and a, a diverse set of students. Because you could teach and test according to where you think the um, evidence is strongest, or I could teach and test according to that, or we could truly teach a, a, a diversity of of views and perspectives. I think it's more about whether or not the candidate or the student can can make an argue a scientific argument, can make a scientific explanation using the evidence that is presented and, or taught, right? I, anyhow, I, we don't have to keep going back and forth, but um, just, just a thought to put out there. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Snyder. Uh, Dr. Olbert. So I appreciate the questions. Um, just a reminder, the standards are approved by the State Board of Education. So if we wanted to create standards that said, you know, throw the whole damn thing out, we could certainly do that. I don't think it would be wise, but we could do that. Um, however, I think that at this point, what I would like to do is make a motion that we call the question. Okay, so we, we have a, a motion to call the question. Do we have a second to call the question? Dr. Pugh seconding the motion to call the question. Um, discussion? No discussion? Uh, discussion of the need to call the question? Yeah. Sure. Um, I still have a, I have like one other question that I'd like to ask. Okay, well, I, I don't think, uh, I don't think anyone's going to object uh, to, to your additional question. Seeing no objection, uh, chair not looking for any objections. Now, why don't you ask your last yeah, question? Yeah, last question. Um, in, in the standards, I was asking about are certain things in there, and you were saying yes and no. How about um, how has a, a quote unquote established science been shown to be incorrect and harmful in the past? Is that kind of thing in there? Uh, again, um, there is a strong emphasis on <clears throat> considering all the evidence to make scientific argument and and understanding the history of how that has been, has happened in the past, would definitely be part of that, under, building that understanding. Yeah, thank you. And then as far as uh, any discussion on the motion, is there anybody else that has questions? I guess that's a valid question to ask. Right. I mean, I, I'm, it, I'm, in point I'm of scared. order, please. My understanding is that when you call the question, it's been seconded. You have a vote. You do. No, vote. that's sort of tabling. I don't think for a, a call to question, you can talk about the impact of a call to question, call the question. I believe it's debatable. Right. You 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 asked to uh, ask your last question. You did. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay. Hearing none, um, it, it seems like we're ready to vote. Um, could we please withdraw the motion to to um, to call the question and move right to a vote on the on the standards and stuff? Would you be uh, yes. amenable to that? Very good. So this is a motion to uh, on. The standards. We had a motion to approve. We had a second um, a motion by Dr. Pritchett, a second by Dr. Hugh to approve the standards. Marilyn, a roll call vote, please. Is there a discussion on the motion? I'm sorry, please. Is there a discussion on the motion? You've just had a 30 minute discussion on the motion. It was already moved and seconded, and you've been having a 30 so, minute discussion on it. Okay. Just point of order, I'm just going to point out when you call the question, the motion cannot be discussed or debated. Oh, as soon good. as you hear it, you... you yeah, we, we appreciate that. That will help us in the future. Thank you very much. There will be a future. Uh, Ms. <laughs> Snyder. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? No. Pritchett? Yes. Pew? Yes. Snyder? No. Strayhorn? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Albridge? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. It is 1216. Uh, board presenters, we appreciate uh, your presentation and your responses to the questions of the board members. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it Thank is 12:16. We will reconvene at 1:15. Okay. Uh, enjoy your lunch. We will see you shortly. Do you have any Advil by any chance?